Well, uh, welcome, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kunli Alekaton from Stanford, who was a student here back in, uh, back in 1991. And he's going to tell us about his 25-year odyssey. So I guess it started back then. I'm not quite sure what he was doing then uh, that was in parallel computing, but maybe he'll tell us. Um, he's had a very distinguished career at Stanford. He was one of the first people, if not the first person, to propose that we start building multi-core machines on a single chip, which Intel subsequently invented. And then, um, <laughs> and then he, uh, he, after that, he founded a company called Afara, which built a multi-core processor on a chip, which you may know as the Niagara series. Sun subsequently bought that company. Their own attempts at the same solution were failing miserably. They were missing their um, market deadlines, and so their solution was to buy a solution, essentially, and that was uh, Farah, which, which, which Kunli was a founder of. And now he's back at Stanford working on, uh, well, he's director of the Pervasive Parallel... Parallelism something. Lab. Parallelism Lab, thank you. And he is uh, looking more at language level issues and specifically domain specific languages that have, uh, that, that's probably a better solution to solving problems. The, and um, I, I won't go into it, but I'll let him explain that. So um, without further ado, Connelly, thank you. So thank you. Uh, very much, Trev, for that introduction. Uh, so, if Trev didn't know what I was doing uh, when I was a, his graduate student, then, you know, <laughs> I don't know who should know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, the uh, Department of CES, is it CES? What, what is it? CSE. CSE, CSE for uh, inviting me to give this lecture. And, you know, whoever orchestrated the weather, you know, my hat's off. I've never seen it this warm at this time in, in the... Uh, in the year, and uh, also I've got to you know, commend you on the, on the building. Uh, this is the second time I've been in the building. I was telling people earlier that I started life uh, down on Central Campus in what is now known as East Hall, and it was East Engine, and I you know, bet it looked a lot worse than it did, uh, does now. And so uh, this is certainly a big upgrade. So I'm going to talk about making parallelism easy, a 25-year odyssey, and yes, it started before 91, at least. Uh, if you count properly. Uh, and uh, you, uh, uh, so it, it's kind of, you know, it's good that there's lots of graduate students in the audience because it's focused uh, on graduate students. And basically what I want to do is, is give you the benefit of, of some of my experience in doing computer systems research. And then hopefully uh, the insights of, that uh, I have over time will, will, will spur you to do interesting work too. Okay, so let's start with a computing stack. So if you look inside a modern com computer system, you'll see a number of levels of abstraction starting at, at the top with applications. And applications are typically written in high-level languages, programming languages, and then compilers translate these programming languages down to machine code, which is run on the hardware uh, with the help of the runtime and the operating system. And then, of course, the architecture or hardware is implemented using integrated circuit technology. And it's my experience that most of the interesting research problems in computing systems require crossing these stack boundaries, right? You can stay within any of the stack boundaries, but I think crossing them uh, leads to the most interesting uh, sorts of, of problems that need to be solved. And I think this is especially true with explicit parallelism. So here we're talking about parallelism, which is managed and orchestrated by the programmer, right? So not automatically created, uh, you know, under the hood, but here the programmer has some role in, in how the parallelism gets executed. And as I've shown, basically it crosses all of the stack boundaries, and as we'll see as we go through the talk, you'll see that we cross all of the stack boundaries, and it makes this a really challenging pro problem to work on because, of course, there are... Uh, uh, trade-offs to be made between the different layers and uh, figuring out how to make these trade-offs uh, correctly is, is pretty challenging. But the uh, benefit of crossing so many stack boundaries is that, you know, typically as a researcher, you can't be an expert in all the different layers. And so you need to reach out to your 
colleagues who are expert, and so this can lead to lots of interesting and fruitful collaborations between people. Uh, so, you know, one of the, the things that makes uh, explicit parallelism so challenging uh, or, or difficult or hard is the fact that there's this tension between what you want to do at the upper levels of the stack and what you want to do at the lower levels of the stack, right? So at the upper levels, you want high productivity for programmers. You want it to be easy for them to, to write programs that are both correct and uh, achieve uh, good performance. And at the bottom, of course, you want to a high performance uh, hardware. And as I said, there's this tension in the things that you want to do for productivity sometimes will lead you to low performance solutions. And the things that you might want to do uh, uh, for, uh, down in the hardware to increase productivity may impact your performance or may lead to higher power. So John Hennessy, who's of course uh, the president of Stanford and a noted computer scientist, uh, says that parallelism is a problem that's as hard as any computer science has ever faced. And so uh, you know, this means that of course that, that lots of ingenuity is going to be required uh, to make parallelism easy. So let me start at the beginning. So this is a, a picture that, that some of you uh, with white hair will recognize. Uh, and, uh, and this is a picture of the NQ10 uh, in, in, uh, when our ACAL was getting started back uh, in, in the mid 80s. Uh, we got a machine uh, that was uh, designed by uh, some people who left Intel. And uh, it was the NQ10. And this board has 64 uh, processors or nodes. Each of the nodes has uh, 128 kilobytes of memory. And in total, you had 8 megabytes of memory on the whole board. And the performance was about half a megaflop. So of course, this board is completely dwarfed by the uh, iPhone that you have in your pocket, right? You know, so, this, you know, so of course, uh, performance was was uh, not nearly as good as you could get today. So the question is sort of how did you write programs for this? Well, you had eight megabytes of memory, but it was divided into these 128 kilobyte chunks. And in order to communicate between the chunks, you had to explicitly send messages back and forth between the different nodes. And uh, at that time, uh, there was no Linux available. And so the, the uh, host ran a uh, custom version or a, a, a custom created version uh, called uh, NQ, called Axis. It was a, a, a Unix version, flavor of, of, of Unix. And uh, each of the individual nodes ran a special node kernel. So developing applications for this machine was actually not that easy. All right? So what happened was, you know, message passing, writing message passing programs was difficult. The machine was, the hardware was, was, was flaky, so it would often die and you'd have to go reboot it. Uh, in fact, you know, as I was discussing with uh, Professor Stout earlier th today, you, you, every graduate student who worked on this machine had a key to the machine room so they could go reboot the machine. And, and, and essentially, the, the software was fragile and buggy. Uh, oh, by the way, NCUBE was a startup, so you know, th that was some of the problem here. And, and, uh, and the overall process of developing software for this machine basically led to fairly low productivity. It was difficult to develop software. And uh, so after this experience, uh, I, you know, I thought parallelism was interested, interesting, but it was clear that the hardware uh, was much more capable than the software, right? And so uh, you know, the hardware was interesting, but the software made it, made it difficult to use. And so based on that, uh, I decided that you know, the more interesting thing to do in architecture was to come work on improving single uh, chip, uh, single CPUs, and so that's what I did for my PhD, and I left parallelism by the side. Okay, so then I went off to Stanford, and uh, the question then became sort of what research direction to go in. You know, how should I uh, focus my research so that I was going to kind of do the sorts of things uh, that would get me tenure at Stanford. Okay, so uh, so this is you know the the kind of uh, you know, in retrospect, this is kind of the, the process uh, that, that, that I went through. And I want to kind of say a few words about picking uh, a research direction, right? So, of course, fundamentally, you want to work on something that's intellectually challenging. I suppose most of us are working on, on things that are intellectually ch 
challenging. And I think for me, that means really crossing multiple stack boundaries. So not just staying within any one layer, but, but uh, uh, crossing the boundaries. Secondly, I think you really want to revisit conventional wisdom, right? So the, you know, most uh, areas have a, a bunch of widely accepted uh, truths about, about uh, uh, the, 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 the research area. And the question is, you know, you know, are these truths fundamental or are they just an artifact of, of the way things have always been done? And so uh, questioning conventional wisdom, I think, is a key element in picking a research direction. Also, picking something that's different and new because it's easier to make progress. It's easier to get your papers published. It's uh, uh, much better than trying to polish uh, the ideas of, 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 uh, of others. And a key thing that, 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 that you want to do in an, 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 in an engineering field like uh, computer engineering or computer science is actually create new engineering uh, ideas and change the way that people actually do engineering, right? And so you should find some way to change the practice of engineering and, and in my case, change the way people design and build computer systems. And finally, you know, you know sort of goes without saying that, that you don't want to be working on things that are close to what industry is doing. Because industry has many more resources and uh, capabilities and, and, and potential knowledge about uh, certain uh, areas than, than you do. And so you know, trying to keep up with industry is, uh, is typically not a good thing. And often it may be the case that the ideas that you're working on, industry doesn't think are good ideas. And the question is, do they not think they're good ideas because fundamentally there are some flaws or it's just because they are still hewing to the conventional wisdom? Okay, so uh, given that then, let's think about what the situation was in the mid-90s when I was kind of trying to pick this research direction, right? So uh, on Top 40 Radio, U2 and Whitney Houston was, was playing. And in the microprocessor uh, world, uh, we, the, uh, we were going through this microprocessor performance boom, right? So clock frequency was increasing at 40% per year. Single processor or single CPU performance was going even faster at 50% per year. And in the computer architecture uh, research realm, there are a lot of people thinking about how to do things to make superscalar architectures better and uh, give ideas for, to, to Intel, right? So, you know, I know there are a lot of people in the audience from, from uh, EX 470, so all the ideas that are, you know, you've been exposed to in that class, you know, a lot of them came out of uh, this period uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the 90s when people were thinking about how to do uh, deep uh, and complex uh, processor pipelines. Uh, but the net result of all of this is, that, of course, that uh, we had a free lunch for the software developers, right? So what does this mean? Well, it means that the software developers, you know, sell software by increasing the number of features that they have in their software. So last year's uh, version has, uh, has fewer features than this year's version. And the problem is, of course, uh, as you add features, potentially you make the software slower. And uh, as far as the uh, software developers were concerned, it, that didn't matter. Because if the software wasn't fast enough today, all they needed to do was wait a little while, and because of the underlying performance improvements from the processor, the software would all of a sudden run fast enough. Okay, so they didn't have to work very hard, and they just got to ride uh, on the successes of the uh, microprocessor performance bo bo boom. But there were clouds on the horizon, right? So one of the uh, trends that was happening in the architecture uh, area was that the techniques for exploiting the, for improving the performance of uh, a single CPU was starting to run out of steam, right? So all the complex pipelining out of order uh, ideas with Braz prediction and, and so on and, and speculative uh, execution was starting to run out of steam and the complexity of actually implementing all those ideas was, was steadily rising. Uh, from the IC technology point of view, what was happening was the interconnect the wires that connect the transistors was not scaling as well as at the speed of the transistors themselves, and so they were lagging, the, the interconnect was lagging behind the speed of the transistors. Okay, so given that, what did uh, my research decide to do? Well, we decided to look at the idea of building 
multiple processors on a chip instead of building one complex CPU. So the idea then is you can take uh, a die and maybe half of it is CPU and half of it is cache. As you, if you look at most microprocessors, that's what you'll see. And so, you know, the traditional way of building the chip was to, of course, take all the CPU area and build one complex CPU. And uh, the alternative that we were proposing was to take multiple CPUs, four CPUs, uh, that were simpler and, and uh, design the micro, microprocessor that way. And so the advantage then is uh, each of the uh, processors was simpler to design and the wires were shorter, right? And so we got to mitigate this problem that long wires were becoming particularly problematic in the, uh, in the IC technologies of the day. Uh, now, of course, uh, having multiple CPUs on a chip made it possible to exploit multi-threaded parallelism. And in fact, if you really wanted to take the most advantage of this sort of multi-core chip, then you actually had to write a parallel program, right? And now, of course, you know, compared with the NQ board that I showed you, uh, actually writing a parallel program for this chip uh, would be much easier because now the processors can actually share memory through the cache very efficiently. However, you still fundamentally had to change your programming model and write a parallel program. Okay, so, you know, what, you know, was the performance potential of this approach? Now, I'm a computer architect by training, and so I have to show you some performance graphs, you know, otherwise, you know, they'd re revoke my union card. Okay, so here we have uh, uh, some performance, and, and basically what I'm showing you is a, is a bunch of, of benchmarks, some fundamentally sequential and some more parallel, and a comparison of the four uh, simpler CPUs versus the one complex CPU. And as you see, you know, down uh, on the left side, the uh, complex CPU is basically winning or, or keeping up with the uh, hydro uh, uh, multi CPU. And then as you, multi core CPU, and then as you move towards the right, as you get more parallel programs, uh, then you can get much better performance. Uh, using the multi-core approach, right? So reasonably close on the sequential applications uh, and then much better on the parallel applications. And so that was uh, the crux of the, uh, the idea uh, presented in a paper that we wrote uh, for ASPLOS in 96 called The Case for a CMP. And this is basically the first paper that kind of lays out the arguments for why uh, this was a good idea. Okay, so... You know, some people thought it was interesting, but, but industry really wasn't very convinced. And one of the reasons they weren't convinced was because now we need to write parallel software. So why is writing parallel software fundamentally so difficult, even in a shared memory environment? So the problem is, of course, the software has to be correct, right? And what does correctness mean? It means that if we're sharing memory, then we have to make sure that we synchronize access to that shared memory so that we get the correct result. But we have to make sure, and, and typically what we're going to do is we're going to use locking. Uh, and the problem with locking is if you do too little locking, then you will have access which is uh, not well synchronized, and you'll have races, and you'll get incorrect program operation. However, you can have too much locking, uh, or locking in, in the wrong order, and this can lead to deadlock, and your program will, will hang. Okay? So now that's correctness. Well, the software also has to perform well, right? So this means, of course, fundamentally, you've got to find enough parallels in your, in your algorithm uh, for, for, for your, to, to, to run well. And you have to make sure you don't have too much synchronization, since locking essentially means stalling, right? So if you have too much synchronization, you'll stall too much, and you won't get good performance. And you can't communicate too much, because if you communicate too much, that also means stalling. And so, Fundamentally, you're between a rock and a hard place. If you do too little, you'll get races. If you do too much, you'll get bad performance and deadlock, right? And so this is a difficult problem. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is there are lots of people, lots of smart people like you, uh, who can write decent sequential programs. And, you know, they might even perform well every now and then. Uh, but few people can actually write uh, correct parallel programs because of all these locking issues. And there's a tiny few gurus who can actually write software which is both correct, parallel software, which is both correct and performs really well. 
Okay? And so this is not a problem. I mean, if you have this problem, then how do you produce all the software that's going to run on all these multi-core devices? Okay? Well, one idea is to say, well, if millions of people can write decent sequential programs, then why can't we take decent sequential programs and turn them into parallel programs? Okay? So what's the fundamental problem here? Okay, well, let's look at some code here, because you know, this is computer science, right? So we're all used to looking at code. Okay, so here we have a loop, and it's a while loop. And basically what we're doing is we're reading sentences from a file, and uh, we're you know, checking to see that, that uh, this is not the end of the, the file. And then we're parsing the sentence, and uh, you know, if we get some error from the parsing, then we, we print out some error message associated with the sentence. It's a fairly easy loop, and the question is, could you parallelize it? All right? Well, I'm not going to give you a quiz, but let's, uh, let's look at this. Right, so, well, maybe we could run this, these loop iterations in parallel if we knew that the read was parallel, you know, that, that we could run multiple versions of the read at the same time, and if we could run multiple versions of the, the pass uh, procedure or function at the same time. But even if we could do that, we have this problem that this loop has an unpredictable exit, right? We don't know any time when the uh, data that we read is going to run out, and so we'd have to have some way of handling that, right? And so the problem with this is that if we give a compiler a loop and say, please parallelize this loop, the compiler has to be conservative, right? It has to guarantee that no matter what happens, it's always safe and legal to run this loop in parallel. And if it can't make that guarantee at compile time, it has to throw up its hands and say, sorry, this loop is not parallel. So many loops like this, and most of the, the time, the reaction of the compiler is, I'm sorry, uh, this is not I can't guarantee that this will run correctly in parallel, and so I can't parallelize this. Okay. So compilers have to be, be conservative, and the question is, you know, you know, can hardware help you be more aggressive at finding parallelism? And so the idea uh, that, that we worked on uh, in, in the Hydra research project was this idea of hardware support for speculation. And the way to think about this is just that it's a safety net that says, even if you go and do things that aren't strictly legal all the time, you will never generate a bad result. You'll always get the right result. It may, be, you, it may take as long as doing it sequentially, but you will at least get the right result. And then if there is parallelism, you'll get higher performance. So with this sort of capability, then potentially you can uh, take sequential programs and automatically parallelize them. And so uh, we did this in the context of Java. So we had a complete system for dynamically parallelizing Java programs. So you take a JVM, you feed it a Java program. Uh, it analyzes the program and sees where the loops are, because that's where most of the parallelism is. It decides how it's going to orchestrate these, these loops uh, to run them in a speculatively parallel manner, uh, and uh, figures out how to move some, so the, the code around to optimize the performance, and uh, uh, then generates the, the parallel code, which relies on this underlying hardware, which provides support for speculation. So uh, the performance was pretty good on floating point apps, because you ex expect those to be dominated by loops. Uh, also, it was pretty good on multimedia apps, again, dominated by loops. And, and of course, integer applications, which are not uh, loop intensive, uh, a lot uh, less performance, but still not bad. And of course, we're starting with Java, which is not as optimized as C, and so things look good. So it is possible to do. Unfortunately, it's not really a scalable solution. So maybe you can do it well, on maybe four or eight cores, but going much further doesn't give you that much benefit. OK, so <coughs> the question then is, so we done, did a bunch of research on multi-core architectures. And as I said, one of the things I wanted, I'd like to do from a research point of view is not just do academic research, uh, which entails publishing papers, but you also want to change. I'd also like to change the way that industry uh, practices engineering, change the way that, 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 that uh, uh, industry uh, designs computers. So what do you do? So you, of course, you've got to write the papers, uh, because after all, we're academics. And then, of course, you also want to develop prototypes. 
uh, to, to be more convincing that your ideas make sense and potentially give them away to people to have them play. You want to give talks and go and, uh, uh, go and uh, talk to engineers who design processes and tell them about your ideas and, and, and convince them uh, that, that, that these are uh, the, right, uh, the right way to, to do designs. But after doing all this, still no one was really convinced. And what was really limiting the acceptance of this approach? Well, one of the things was the fact that single thread performance was still improving at 50% per year, right? And so as long as that was going on, people said, so why should I care about this model of uh, building microprocessors that involves changing the way I do things and more importantly, changing all the software that has to run uh, on, the, uh, on the microprocessors. And so because of these reasons, the fact that you know, industry is naturally conservative, they want to keep doing the same old thing until it really hurts. And when it really hurts, then maybe they'll still continue. <laughs> uh, so, so the idea then is sort of, you know, we, we're faced with the fact that we thought these were really good ideas and, 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 and we didn't think that they would see the light of day unless we actually uh, played a part in transferring the knowledge from academia to industry. And so how do you do that? Uh, how do you, you transfer from academia to industry? Well, you could go to industry the, yourself, go to an existing company, and, and try and, and, uh, and go and uh, push your idea that way. Uh, but another way to do that, of course, uh, a way that is uh, a path that is well trodden at Stanford is to do a startup. Okay? And so that's what I did. So the name of the startup was called Afara Web Systems, and this was the, the logo. So Afara means bridge in Yoruba, which is a, a West African language, and so that's why the logo was a bridge. So it was founded in 1999, which was the height of the internet boom, right? You know, everybody was starting up some internet company to sell, you know, pet food and what have you uh, on the internet. And what was happening in the data centers is for these large websites, they were running out of both space and power. And part of that was really because the microprocessors they were using, Pentium 3 and Pentium 4 at the time, were really not optimized for the kinds of workloads that were being used in these internet data centers. So the goal of, of, of Afara then was to revolutionize internet data centers, which of course was a huge market, multi-billion dollar market, and approach and do that by, by, by getting a 10 times performance per watt uh, improvement with a new microprocessor based on CMP technology. And the obvious question is, is why do you as a startup think that you can uh, compete with Intel, Sun, DEC, and all the other microprocessor companies uh, and, and, uh, and actually um, uh, come up with something that, 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 that might be uh, better uh, with, with a lot fewer engineers? Well, the key thing uh, is that the CMP approach allows you to do things both more simply and also at higher performance. And so uh, after I uh, kind of uh, pitched this idea to a few VCs, at least two of them uh, bit, and I was able to, to develop uh, a, a team and I had uh, top people from all the existing processor companies and other systems companies. And the whole idea was to design both the chip and the system around the chip, right? Turns out you can sell your, uh, thing, your, 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 uh, your product for a lot more money if it's a system with software uh, and a chassis than if you're just trying to sell a chip. So doing chip companies is, is hard. Selling appliances with software gives you more margins. And so uh, the idea, you know, one of the VCs says, you know, we're going to start with $20 million, but we'll committed to give you $100 million all the way to go to market with this idea. And he said, this is a big boy project, and it means big boy money. And so this is uh, uh, what, what it was about. And so here is one of the slides uh, from uh, the pitch I gave uh, to, to the VCs when I was raising money. And basically, it, it's arguing that, that this approach is uh, one that will really work because both from a software point of view, uh, we have lots of open standards, and so it's possible to uh, have software available that could run on a new architecture. That from the point of view of the type of workload, uh, there was lots of parallel work. There's multiple 
uh, internet packets, uh, multiple network packets, multiple requests, because this was server sorts of applications, and multiple sessions. And the key thing is that in a server environment, throughput is more important than latency, right? So uh, because you are accessing the server over a wide area network uh, link, it's more important to have multiple sessions and multiple requests being serviced at the same time rather than uh, to increase, decrease the latency of any single request, right? So uh, if you looked at the type of workloads, you would find that you know, exploiting ILP with a complex pipeline didn't give you much benefit, and the cache behavior of the workloads was also pretty bad, and so small caches uh, didn't buy you very much. So these were the, the characteristics of the microprocessors at the time, and so the argument was, okay, well, you know, this wasn't giving you a lot of benefit, it was wasting a lot of power, and you could do much better, a factor of 10 better at least. Okay, so uh, that was the idea of uh, uh, kind of motivating Hydra, and uh, the, small motiv sorry, the, the Hydra idea motivated uh, the Niagara approach, and the, high, uh, and the key idea was high performance per watt, so being uh, energy or power efficient, and high throughput for commercial server applications, okay? So lots of thread level parallelism uh, with limited amounts of instruction level parallelism and very bad cache behavior. And so the way that you're going to design the chip is by having many simple cores versus fewer complex cores. So you throw out all the complex, fancy, um, uh, sophisticated pipelining techniques. You throw out branch prediction. You throw out uh, multiple issue. And what you get is a simpler processor that burns less power, that is simpler to design, and can be done with a few smart engineers rather than teams of hundreds of engineers. Uh, and then, so, uh, so the idea then was to have a microprocessor with 32 threads. Uh, and we'll see that those threads were organized as, uh, as eight groups of four threads. And then a memory system that could feed all those threads. And again, you want very high bandwidth both to the shared cache and also off-chip to the DRAM. So, so we founded the company in 99. Then three years later, the market looked a lot different, right? So we went from the dot-com boom to the dot-com bomb. And uh, the VCs who promised you know, funding the company all the way to uh, the market with $100 million decided that they really didn't want to do that anymore. So they wanted to cash out. And uh, at the same time, you know, we had implemented Spark processes. And the Sun processor design uh, group was not actually uh, coming up with processes which were both meeting the deadlines and meeting, meeting the performance uh, goals that the company wanted. So they decided to buy us. And most of the team moved from Afara to Sun and continued uh, designing the process. We were basically almost done. We, we, we were about to tape out, and then, uh, uh, then uh, we got sold to Sun. OK? And so about, uh, you know, six, about a year later, after changing some things, the key thing that we had to change was the I.O. bus. We came out with a chip called Niagara One, uh, or the UltraSpark uh, T1. Uh, and as you see, it's got four, so it's got eight cores. Each of these cores has uh, four threads. And uh, each of the cores communicates to a on-chip level two cache. And you can see the four banks of the cache at the four corners, and then you had four interfaces to DRAM. Okay, so lots of bandwidth to DRAM, uh, basically a factor of two more bandwidth to DRAM than most microprocessors, and a crossbar in the center communicating between all the processors and the cache. So one of the first VLSI projects I did with, with Trevor was a crossbar, and so the idea of crossbars kind of stuck with me. Uh, all the way through uh, to uh, this design. And, uh, and uh, oh, one thing, other thing is that we had a single floating point unit for the whole chip. Okay, so it turns out that 
In server benchmarks, floating point wasn't that important, so why spend a lot of uh, uh, chip real estate doing floating point if uh, it's not an important uh, uh, part of the, uh, the instruction mix? Okay, so let's say a little bit about the performance of Niagara versus uh, the alternative at the time. And for that, let me just briefly talk about uh, what e-business applications look like in, in the data center, right? So what you typically have is this three-tier model, right? So the first tier is the web server tier. Uh, and this typically, of course, uh, generates the web content uh, that you're going to see in your browser, OK? So there may be static web content and dynamic web content. And then the middle tier is the application server tier. And this tier basically implements the business logic. So if you've got a shopping cart, it manages the shopping cart and does the, the updates. And then uh, the last tier is the database server tier. And this tier you know, keeps the persistent data, right? So when you finally check out and you give uh, uh, the uh, site your credit card number, it records uh, the transaction in the uh, database. And so at each of the tiers, there are different benchmarks. There's Web 2005 for the uh, Spec Web 2005 for the uh, Web tier, uh, Spec JBB uh, 2005 for the uh, Application Server tier, and, and uh, TPCC for the Database tier. Okay, so given that, let's look at some performance. Uh, so this is comparison with Pentium 4. So the scale is relative to Pentium 4. And uh, comparing versus IBM Power 5 Plus, Opteron, and Niagara, which were, these are all contemporary processes to Niagara. And so what you see here is that the throughput spec in rate number for all four processes is roughly the same. Uh, and both the other three processes all beat uh, the Pentium 4 by a bit. This is the spec FP rate. Uh, and uh, what we see here is that the IBM Power 5 Plus does really well. The Opteron is on par with Intel. And there's no number here for Niagara since Sun never released one. However, if they did, it's not clear that the uh, uh, graph would look much different. Because remember, we only have a single floating point unit, right? And then uh, the spec JBB, uh, and now here you have... Uh, uh, Niagara doing you know, a factor of three better on, on spec GB, JBB, a factor of, of, of six uh, better than uh, on, on spec web, and a factor of uh, three better on TPCC. So that's throughput performance. How about performance per watt? Now, the other thing, of course, is that uh, the Niagara uses a lot less power than these other processes. And so here you, you uh, are starting to get uh, uh, factors of 5 to 10 better in terms of performance of watt per watt on commercial server benchmarks. And so, you know, we, ac you actually did show that this approach works, and you actually get the advantages that uh, we said <coughs> you could get. And, uh, of course, Intel and others started to take note once we, uh, we showed these results. Okay, so what happened? Well, you know, time marched on from the 90s, and uh, uh, the tricks that, that were you being used to increase single thread performance started to reach uh, a, a plateau, right? So power consumption became a really big deal. The wire delays started to really limit what sorts of the size of processes you could design, and the amount of design and verification that was required for these complex pipelines uh, became quite high. And so Intel made what they call the right-hand turn, right? So they, they were to move away from frequency and, as performance, and it was multi-everywhere, -every, so multi-thread and CMP. So this came from the IDF um, in September 2004. So they called it a right-hand turn. I prefer to think of it as a U-turn. And so they... they went away from this idea of frequency, and they kind of started to do things that, which were a lot less, uh, much, more, much shallower pipelines, and uh, multi-threading and CMP were big elements of their design, as we see now. Uh, so if we kind of look at uh, the broader picture, we can see uh, the microprocessor trends. We have the red line being the transistor count, 
of uh, microprocessors over the years. And so you see this going up with Moore's law. Uh, the blue dots show the performance. And you see the performance leveling off around 2005. And that is being driven by the fact that the power is leveling off. And the power leveling off uh, levels off frequency. And frequency was the main driver for, perform for single thread performance. OK. so. Uh, my group uh, at, uh, that I brought into, into Sun, which is, of course, now Oracle, continues to design microprocessors around the uh, principles that we established uh, with the Niagara 1. So there was the uh, T2, or Niagara 2, which had uh, uh, 64 threads. Uh, then there was uh, T3, which had 128 threads. And so basically, we're doubling performance each time. Uh, then uh, more recently, there's T4, which goes back to 64 threads, but the, process, the, the pro CPUs or, or cores themselves become more powerful uh, to broaden the uh, number of application spaces that you could use this sort of chip for. Right? So the idea was that, that uh, Sun decided they didn't want to have multiple microprocessors. They wanted to use a single microprocessor for all their different of classes of application. And so it was necessary to make the uh, cores more powerful. But notice the crossbar is still here, and the, the multiple threads are still here, uh, and that the shared cache is still there. And then T5, which was just announced at Hot Chips, uh, basically, again, doubles the number of threads. Uh, going to 128 uh, threads, but now, of course, we're, we're running at uh, above 3 gigahertz. So the idea now is that this is the dominant way of designing processes at Sun, and if we looked at Intel, of course, we wouldn't see designs that are as, are as aggressive as this, but again, you would see uh, a lot of the multi-core ideas that we established uh, with Niagara One. Okay, so where are we today? So today, we're in a power-constrained world, right? It doesn't matter where we're talking about the mobile device in your pocket, which, of course, is uh, running on a battery and is passively cooled, or whether we're talking about the data center, uh, which, in which the amount of computing you can do is constrained by the, the amount of power you can deliver and the amount of cooling that you can uh, deliver to get the heat out. And so the issue then is how do you uh, design computing systems which are more power efficient. So one of the ways that you can do that is by coming up with something which is more specialized. Okay? And so if you look, at, and so specialization means that it's not one size fits all. Now you have heterogeneity, right? And so uh, there's already heterogeneity today. And so today, if you look across the computing space, you'll see multi-core, GPU, maybe some reconfigurable architectures, maybe based on FPGAs. And then, of course, you'll see clusters uh, based uh, on, on nodes that contain all of these three types of architectures. However, what does this mean to the programmer? It means that the programmer has a lot, has a pretty difficult time uh, to actually program these heterogeneous architectures. Uh, you have multiple threads, uh, programming models with locks. Uh, for the multi-core, you have some sort of data parallel programming model like CUDA for the GPU. You have to actually design hardware to uh, uh, map to a FPJ. And of course, to cross multiple address spaces, you have to fall back on message passing or maybe a, a model like PGAS. And so what does this mean then? That if you're an application developer who either wants to simulate the future wants to deal with the present either virtually in a virtual world or you want to design some application that, that uh, deals with the real world in real time in a robotic situation. Or maybe you have a huge amount of data that you want to analyze that was created in the past. Now you have to convert your application into these low-level programming models in order to get advantage of a modern heterogeneous parallel uh, computing environment. And there's a wide gulf between the ideas you have in the application space and what you need to do to get high performance. Okay, so the hypothesis that is currently driving my research is it is possible to write one program and run it efficiently on all these machines. 
Okay, so what should that program look like? Okay, so we think the program should look like a domain-specific language. So what is a domain-specific language? Well, it's a language that is targeted to a specific domain with operators and data types that match that domain and abstractions that match that domain. So it's much easier and more natural to write applications using the DSL. The key thing about DSLs is it's restricted, right? It's not general purpose. It can't do everything. Uh, however, the restrictions allow it to be more productive in a particular domain. So what are some good examples? So those of you who deal with matrix and linear algebra know that MATLAB is a, is a fairly good example, and it's an example of a uh, domain-specific language. If we're talking about uh, manipulating, manipulating relations in a database, then SQL is another example of a domain-specific language. If you go to the graphics world, OpenGL can be thought of as a domain-specific language. So what are the advantages then of doing, using a domain-specific language to get both high productivity and performance? Well, the productivity uh, idea is, is fairly straightforward. You shield, shield the programmer from having to deal with these low-level programming models, and you allow the programmer to say declaratively what they want to achieve rather than how uh, they are going to do it with, with the detailed implementation issues. From the point of view of performance, the key idea is to take abstractions in the domain and map them to elements that we're going to call parallel patterns that can be efficiently executed on a variety of different uh, architectures. And the key thing that is allow you, it's going to allow you to do this mapping between domain abstractions and parallel patterns in an efficient and effective way is to restrict what the domain-specific language can do. So that way you constrain what you, the domain-specific language can do and you make it easy for the compiler of the domain-specific language to do this translation. Furthermore, what you want to do is use domain knowledge to do optimizations that you could never do in a general purpose programming language. And so this is going to give you high performance. And then finally, what you're going to be able to do then is, as you move to architectures with more processes or with different types of heterogeneity, what you do is you re-implement the compiler rather than changing the programming language, sorry, so rather than changing the program. Okay? So the applications don't change, just the, uh, the DSL compiler and the runtime. So here's the, 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 the picture uh, of programming with domain-specific languages. So the idea then is you start with applications uh, that I listed before, and you have a number of DSLs. You might use R for statistics, or R something R-like. You might use uh, a graph uh, algorithm uh, DSL. You might have a MATLAB-like DSL, one that we call Optimal, which is uh, used for machine learning, which is basically based on matrix and linear algebra. And then each of these DSLs uh, could be merged together in a single program, so they can interoperate together. And then they each have a DSL compiler, which can take programs written in that DSL and translate them into a variety of different architectures uh, listed at the bottom here. Okay, so let me show you some examples quickly. So Optimal, as, as I said, is a DSL for machine learning based mainly around matrix and linear algebra. And uh, the motivations for the DSL, as, a, as I said, raise a level of abstraction and allow for domain-specific optimization. Another example uh, is GreenMall. And GreenMall is used for analyzing large social network graphs or graphs that have low diameter, right? So, you know, you've all heard of six degrees of separation. Well, that's typical of a social network graph. Another graph they might, might want to analyze is a movie database. Uh, and so you might want to ask questions about the movie database network, such as, you know, you know, is Kevin Bacon really the center of the world? Or how often do all, you know, these actors, Ben Stiller, Jack Black, and Owen Wilson appear in movies together? So these are kind of, you know, 
uh, somewhat interesting examples, but essentially there's the whole notion of analyzing data, what people have been called big data, is uh, something that, that uh, has uh, lots of interest uh, among lots of different constituencies today. So uh, in uh, computational biology, in, in social network analysis, and in, in data analysis in general, it's uh, something that uh, is, is, uh, is often done. And uh, you can often represent uh, the information in some of these big data sets as graphs. So that's an, uh, uh, an example DSL. Another example uh, would be work we are doing with a group of people in bioengineering. And they have a center which they call the National Institute of Health Center for Simulation Biology. And this group wants to simulate biology at multiple levels. They want to be able to simulate how proteins fold. They want to simulate how cells and viruses interact. And they want to simulate how muscles and the skeleton system interact for artificial prosthesis. Right? And so essentially then they've got their own sets of DSLs that they uh, have developed. And they also want them to be able to run at very high performance on a variety of architectures. So uh, more DSLs being developed there. And finally, recently uh, I've uh, been involved in a research grant to look at high performance uh, genomics. Right? So the idea is there are a bunch of next generation sequences which are making uh, the generation of uh, genome sequence is very cheap, so you've got huge amounts of data and you want to analyze it to uh, understand disease, understand a bunch of things about uh, me medical th things that you can do by doing gene analysis, and again, we are developing DSLs for this. So the question then is, there's lots of DSLs, and the, 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 question, the question is sort of, how are we going to make developing all of these DSLs tractable? And so the second hypothesis driving uh, this work is it is possible to, to significantly sim simplify DSL development using a common DSL infrastructure. So the idea then is why reinvent the wheel for each DSL, pick out some common elements within each DSL and put those in a framework and then allow multiple DSLs to be developed on top of that framework. Uh, so the idea then is you want to be able to scale the DSL development approach. So the way to think about DSLs is you are a smart CS uh, graduate and you want to code up a parallel program. So one way to do that is to pick some application and code up the parallel program, but now the knowledge that you've imbued into that parallel program is fixed, right? And unless somebody wants to do exactly what you want to do in that program, there's no way for them to reuse your hard work. So what we want to do with these DSLs is to allow you to use your knowledge uh, to, uh, and, and, and create these high performance applications in such a way that that knowledge can be reused by other people who want to do similar things. Okay, so, so you, you want to enable these, these CS graduates to, to easily create new DSLs and create reusable knowledge. And uh, the whole goal is a few smart CS uh, graduates can enable a la much larger number of people with less knowledge uh, by creating DSLs. OK, so let me briefly say what the infrastructure looks like. Uh, the infrastructure is called Delight. Uh, and so the elements that Delight has, fundamentally, I've talked about domain-specific languages. The way that we actually implement them is actually as libraries. So think of these as domain-specific libraries, but these libraries are smart libraries. These libraries can optimize themselves. They can analyze themselves. They can take programs written using these libraries and look across the, all the library core boundaries and do very high-level optimization. So you want to be able to do domain-specific optimization. So these parts in blue get done by the DSL developer, the smart CS graduate. And then these parts in red get done by the framework. So the framework then can take the optimizations of the domain abstractions and apply parallelism optimizations, which are generic, across all the DSLs. So you get to leverage this part. And then it can take those parallel optimizations 
and apply them to parallel patterns. And these patterns are meant to run on a variety of different heterogeneous architectures. And the net result then is both what we call abstraction without regret, right? The notion that you can develop something which has high productivity, but also has high performance. So you didn't have to give up uh, the performance to get the high productivity. OK, so let me summarize what I've talked about, right? So, uh, so the idea, you know, if, you want this, if there's one takeaway message uh, from the talk, then it's this notion of breaking across boundaries, right? So this is the computing stack. And we want to break across the boundaries because that's the way that we're going to get high performance. So it's showing, showing you some examples from uh, ex explicit parallelism. But uh, these are uh, you know, just examples that could be used in, in other areas, other domains. OK, so break boundaries. Of course, uh, breaking across the layers in the computing stack means breaking the boundaries between your colleagues in academia. Uh, and then, of course, potentially, if you want to see your ideas get used in engineering practice, you need to break the boundary between academia and industry. Okay? So as I said, these are examples from uh, my experience in making parallelism easy. But I think that if you do anything really interesting, you will naturally break boundaries. Okay? So thank you. So I should do before I end, I, I have worked with a lot of very uh, great collaborators, and uh, there's some of them are listed here. And uh, you know, not, none of the stuff that I've been able to do would have been possible without uh, these collaborators, both uh, advisors and, and students and, and colleagues. And working with people is one of the hallmark, hall, working with really bright people is one of the hallmarks of being in academia. And uh, as I said, uh, none of this would have been possible without them. So there they are. So I didn't see towards the end a really clear connection between your DSLs and an execution Where's that going? By see how you go from yeah those arrows. <laughs> yeah, because. I didn't, want to get into, I didn't want to get into the details of, of compilation technology, right? And that's, but what we have is we have a, let me see, do I have any more slides? Well, so one thing we have is we have code that you can download. <laughs> uh, but, but essentially what we have is an environment that, that takes uh, DSLs, which were embedded in this programming language called Scala, and on top of uh, the libraries, uh, you go through the process of what we call staging. And staging takes the programs written using these libraries and converts them into an intermediate representation. That intermediate representation is optimized at multiple levels. It's optimized at the uh, level of abstraction of, of the domain, it's optimized at the parallel level, and it's optimized at the generic uh, scala level, scalar level, I should say. And then the result then is something that can be used to generate code for a variety of different architectures. So, and this is Scala? This is in Scala, yes. So, um, and what is it right now? Does it target? So today, so, so today it targets uh, multi-core, GPU, and uh, we're on the verge of doing clusters. So how does it compare to what I can buy? Uh, well, you can't buy anything that... that, that, that no, but, you know, so, you so, so how does it compare to, to yeah. MATLAB? So it's better than MATLAB, much better than MATLAB. It's basically on par with hand... Yeah. Yes, it's basically on, on par with, with, with the coding uh, CUDA by hand. Yeah. I guess, was it a positive experience, or was it a... Yeah, it was positive. It was, it was absolutely positive. It was positive because, A, the experience of starting, you know, I, one of the things people ask about is sort of how much, uh, how scholarly is doing a startup, right? 
And, you know, I would say my most cited paper is the paper that came out of my startup. So, I mean, it definitely has an impact. And I think we explored ideas that, that could not have been explored in academia. Uh, and uh, I think that it also gave the opportunity for the kind of, kind of initial CMP ideas that we developed in Hydra to see the light of day. So yeah, that's definitely something I would do again. Now, you know, having done that, it was great to go back to our academia and work with smart students and do whatever I wanted and not have the pressure of uh, VCs breathing, breathing down my neck. You know, because uh, there is this notion that, you know, when you're in a company that you need to make money, right? right. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, what was the low point? So did you ever feel like you, had to, you were going to get out? And no, there was never really a low point. I mean, there, you know, there was, we were stuck in, in New York over 9-11. That was kind of <laughs> not so hot. But apart from that external issue, right, I think, you know, the things went incredibly well. I think, you know, as my uh, co uh Co-founder said you know, he'd never, and he'd been, he'd been a veteran of many companies, and he'd never found a group of engineers that were quite as good as the group that we assembled at Afara. And part of that was, you know, it was a neat idea, and part of it was, was him, because he's a very uh, well-known guy. Les Cohn was his name. Other questions? It, Scholar. Scholar, well, Scholar has a life of its own, right? So it's being used by a number of different uh, people. It's being used in the financial industry. It's being used by Twitter. It's being used at, used at LinkedIn. And, and there's a number of people who use Scholar. So Scholar, and I haven't said much about it for those of you who are not at all familiar, Scholar is a language which tries to combine functional programming concepts with object-oriented concepts. And it generates Java bytecode, so it's con completely interoperable with Java. And it has a lot of nice features which make the sort of thing that we want to do possible. Uh, I didn't say much about it because I didn't want to uh, get into too much detail, but this whole notion of being able to embed one language in t inside another requires a very sophisticated type system and the capability to redefine all parts of the language, even things like for and if and while. So you can redefine that inside the libraries. And this is why you've got so much power, right? Because you can essentially uh, take in a uh, representation of something which is legal scholar will run and then completely change the way that, you, that it operates. I think that's okay, right? I mean, for some programmers, not for every programmers, uh, every programmer. I mean, there are lots of programmers who, who just think in, in MATLAB or just think in SQL. Uh, that's already the case. Yeah. The majority of programmers yeah. work in a very domain-specific space, yeah. and you know that algorithmic sophistication is sort of limited by that. And that's probably where you want to keep it. Know. Yeah, because... Yeah, exactly. You let them out of that space and they start doing things that, <laughs> that A, you can't understand, and B, don't necessarily lead, lead to performance. You also don't want them to do premature optimization, right? You want to do optimization based on, you know, the particular target that they uh, are, are aiming for, right? So they might start out with some sort of... Um, DSP algorithm, and they might, may want to initially target it to a DSP, and then maybe they want to retarget it to a GPU, and then later to some sort of uh, hardware or FPGA. And optimizations may change based on, on, on what the target is. And, and so you don't want them to encode any extra knowledge, necessarily, uh, that would impede you from making the right trade-offs for that particular target. Yeah. It's actually pretty general purpose, right? I mean, it's got all op object overloading and all those things. So you talked about having to restrict the domain specific yeah, yeah. in order to do this kind of optimization. So how much would you have to restrict MATLAB uh, to, to be able to do the kind of optimization you're talking about? Well, so we don't do all of the MATLAB. So, so essentially, we want to restrict it to basic linear algebra yeah, okay, sure. capabilities, right? Yeah. And, but, but we can allow you to do sophisticated sorts of things, such as, you know, you can do... You could do 
uh, you can deal with objects and you can structure your program with, with using modern um, uh, structured programming methods. So the beta version will have that? Because I noticed on your web page the, the, the alpha release lists two domain specific languages and now you're working with MATLAB, maybe some other. Uh, uh, yeah, so it probably li lists optimal and. Yeah, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah so we, we, we never intend to do. So I was just using MATLAB as an example. We never intend to actually do MATLAB because MATLAB is owned by MathWorks and it's not open, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, a question is on the back end side, where you are targeting the uh, ESL to different platforms. Yeah. So nowadays, compilers don't really take backup information back from the hardware to when compiling. Like, GCC would only understand I'm targeting Spark or I'm targeting ACP. Yeah. But it doesn't take information like I'm targeting GPU, which has this many registers, this much cache, shared memory. Yeah, yeah. So Yeah, so we don't do anything uh, that is that specific today for G GPUs, but we do, essentially we'll, we'll generate code for, uh, I should, you know, now I have all these questions on, on the DSL compiler, I should have put more information in. But uh, what we have is we have the ability to uh, have kernels or these patterns and have them generate code for multiple different targets, right? And so we'll generate all the targets, uh, GPU, multi-core, uh, and cluster, and then uh, at runtime we'll specialize for the exact t number of cores. We don't do any specialization for GPU today, uh, but we uh, potentially could. I mean, so, so you know, it's generic CUDA, right? It's not specialized to any particular uh, NVIDIA chip. Yeah. Yes. So, well, an algorithm, you know, well, sort of an algorithm data and, and uh, a data type. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, if you want to generate a, you know, high performance code for a specific hardware, probably you need to care more things, not only for like the parallelism itself, but also like memory organization. Oh, absolutely. So, so the, you know, so the, again, <laughs> uh, so so the, the way that, the way to think about structuring domain-specific languages in, in Delight is you need to have a, a way of structuring the computation and the data. And so you need to, an abstract way of, of, of thinking about the data so that the, the compiler can optimize the data layout and optimize the locality of your, your, your uh, computation. So that's absolutely important. Well, I mean, that would require you actually knew what the data itself, I mean, not the data sizes were, you know, for, for the data rather than in an abstract sense, what the data layout looks like. You actually knew what the actual size of the data uh, was. And that would require that you feed information at runtime. So we currently don't do any optimizations at runtime besides, you know, figuring out how much parallelism uh, gets executed on some given number of processes, but uh, we don't do any any cache size optimizing. You know, like blocking is something that potentially we would have to do if we would optimize the blocking for uh, the cache size. Then we'd have to do that at runtime. 